Chapter 5 of uh, Dr. Hardin's textbook on classroom management. This chapter, Logical Consequences, uh, it covers several things uh, the, about uh, managing a classroom that are starting to depart from our completely external influence. And you'll see what we're talking about here. We're drawing on the research of uh, behaviorists like Alfred Adler, um, Dreikers, but the more modern ones are Linda Albert and uh, Nelson. Let's, I'll show you in here. Uh, this is a shift from strictly behavior focus to a more student-centered approach, and that's what I just hinted at a while ago. The, um, the idea is looking behind what is the reason that a student does something. Very often we want to ask our students when they misbehaved, why did you do that? And, of course, the universal answer is because they don't know what to tell you or they don't have the vocabulary or they're not really, indeed, not really sure consciously. But the, the, uh, the research of these guys says that students misbehave for one of four different things. And we'll talk about that just right now. Alfred Adler and Rudolf Dreikers, who were the basic ones, said that uh, students misbehave for a reason. That the behavior, the behavior has something generating and it generally has some sort of social recognition, social uh, involving other students and in their class and how they're perceived in the classroom. They say, now this is uh, uh, Adler and Dreikers and uh, these researchers who go with this logical consequences say that uh, everybody who is a student, and you and I are the same way, we all have to try to sort of find a way how we fit in socially in the classroom, regardless of what age we are. And that influences our behavior. It's an external influence on our behavior. Uh, because we react to that or we try to think that we're reacting to that uh, in the process. So uh, this misbehavior, if they're unable to, to fit in, starts. And here are the, uh, we'll get to the parts here in just a second. Uh, their point, which is again different from the ones we've talked about before, says that uh, teachers have to help students, and it says right here on the bottom of the uh, slide, that students have to take responsibility for their own actions. That certainly represents a shift very much away from our meter of completely external influence on students' behavior. By the students taking their own responsibility for their actions, that implies that there's some sort of internal motivation involved with it. So, Albert Nelson say that students misbehave for one of four reasons. One, to seek attention. This is those students who are there. There's really a good and a bad kind. We'll go through these briefly, and I'll go back through them individually in just a second. To gain power in the classroom or over other students or over their own life, uh, looking for revenge, some perceived injustice, and then the last one and the trickiest one to deal with is the one to who misbehave to avoid failing. And we'll see how that seems like to be a contradiction in terms, but it works out very fine. Let's look at this. The attention seeking, there's the good and bad kind. You know, the constructive, or I'll say constructive and destructive type there. We all know these people, the kiss up, the overachiever, the ones that has to, they operate to entirely to please the teacher. They're trying to gain that social recognition in there. And maybe perhaps some of you, um, that uh, if you're the teacher's pet. Now, this is misbehaving to gain attention. So you may not be misbehaving in order to do this, but certainly that's a constructive kind of, of uh, behavior in terms of getting attention is by being the teacher's pet. It means you've already done something in the past that has earned that status with the teacher. The bad side is the show-off, the one who just is pulling attention away in order to distract from what's going on in the classroom. That is the student that we have to watch in terms of the attention-seeking student. The power-seeking student, uh, it's pretty obvious here what it says on the slide. It says, uh, wants to be the boss, will contradict, lie, have temper tantrum, temper tantrum uh, questioning the teacher's ability. Especially, they'll do it out front, uh, openly, in front of other students because they're trying to gain power either, either over the teacher and to show off their power in front of other students. Uh, you have some of that more often in the middle school and higher students, but it also happens in some of the younger students, too. But underneath all of that, the student feels that something is that, that they are not good enough. They feel inferior. And so, and the phrase I put right here says outwit, outplay, outsmart means that 
uh, that I stole that phrase from the survivor, of course, and that's what they're trying to do. They're just trying to survive. And in order to do that, they have to find something they can gain power over. If you have a student who has a terrible home life, who knows that they're not in their social status, may not be uh, advancing academically, all those types of things, they're going to try to find something and gain the power of it. I had one student uh, who taught from, uh, who was with me for, I had her for three years, and she never said a full sentence to me the entire time that she was there. In fact, I don't think she ever said a word to me at all. I know that she spoke to other students because I would see her talking to them on the playground. She talked to her homeroom teacher just barely. And at first I thought she was being defiant or just being something, uh, you know, mean uh, or uh, really misbehaving with me. But this child is a sweet child otherwise and knows the answers. The work that she would do would be very good. It would indicate that she knew the work. So why was this child not speaking? It's one of those things where once I found out, and I believe I told you about this earlier in the semester, uh, I found out that this child, uh, the home life was very poor. They had been living in a car for several weeks and winter was coming on and the principal and social workers and folks had gotten finally just recently gotten them into an apartment but they had no furniture we were singing the song there were ten in the bed and the little one said roll over and so we were going around the room talking about who do who sleeps in the bed with you and some of them was you know my dog or my sister or my brother or my parents things like this this one little girl then when I got to this girl uh, she looked at me and said I said you what do you mean you don't sleep I said, who sleeps in the bed with you? Nobody. Nobody sleeps in the bed with her. And I asked the guidance counselor about it later, and she said, no, it's because nobody has a bed in their house. And I thought, because I knew this, this, uh, this girl had several brothers and sisters, and that's why it seemed odd to me. Uh, and so her power, I think the reason why she was not talking is that's the one thing that she had power over. She didn't absolutely have to talk to anybody if she didn't want to. And she could feel that kind of control. So students will misbehave. We can call this misbehaving because they're not responding to you in the classroom uh, and for a variety of reasons, but they've got to be able to find the power. Uh, many, off, Very often those students who like to uh, uh, want to have this power are the ones who try to show up the teacher. So we have to watch out for those too. Now, the revenge-seeking student, we're talking Columbine and things like that. Uh, obviously, those are the obvious ones. But sometimes it's little things, and it starts very small. But it happens. When the student has perceived, and once again, it may not have actually happened, but if the student perceives it that way, that's the process, that the behavior is the result of not just one or two disappointments and discouragements. It's from a long series of things where they've just gotten to the point to where I'm overwhelmed, I can't do anything more about it. Uh, everybody is against me, uh, that uh, kind of business. That kind of person can be a very threatening student, and we have to watch out for those students and watch and be very aware of whether or not they are feeling that they've been discouraged or, uh, or um, uh, put down. It's also the reason why I talked in class about being able to find challenge, students are challenged academically and you go to work with them, you must find a way for them to feel success in the classroom. Let them have that one, yes, I got it right. So they can see what it feels like to succeed. Because many students have not had that opportunity. And that's a that's an awful thing to feel like. But that's uh, the reason why some of these students who don't get that opportunity take out revenge against others. And we have to watch out for that. So the, finally, the last one, these are the students who have been down this road they tried to get attention that didn't work they've tried these other things they've even tried working at revenge and that's probably more than likely uh, ricocheted against them uh, to where the point they're just shutting down now the the more simple version of this is whether you pass out the test and it's time to start the test and the student looks at it and you go and all the students are just about through with the test and you look and this student hasn't done one problem they're staring at that test or they're not staring at it at all they're just sitting there and you ask them, do you, you explain to them very kindly, you know, you need to work on this test. They'll grab that paper and water it up and throw it on. I'm not going to take your stupid test. Now, to them, they have not failed the test because they didn't try. And that's the part where if they're avoiding failure, they'll do anything in order to be 
to get on that to get one more F. The and that includes the fake uh, report cards going home, any of that kind of thing. If the student sees that you are powerless to do this to help them, they may go further down the drain. So you really should keep your eyes open for that student who is beginning to really start shutting down. I'm not going to try. That's another reason why we should have a safe classroom where students can feel uh, um, enabled to try and, and not succeed and then not suffer negative consequences about it, but instead to get encouragement to try again. So those are the four types there. Now, uh, Dreiker says that first thing that we do when we go to identify the student's goal is see how you feel about it. What is your reaction to them? And then whenever you try something, what is the student's reaction to the intervention? That can help give you a clue as to which of those four categories that they work into. And here's what happens if you don't, uh, if you allow them to manipulate the situation. The attention seeking student, if they see that you're annoyed, or irritated about it, it'll stop it temporarily. And that's the business of, John, will you stop tapping your pencil? And then it stops for a few minutes, but it comes back. And it's because uh, it, it's only a temporary stop to the process. John realizes now he's got something that gets him attention. Even negative attention is attention in a student's mind, in a child's mind. If they see that they are, that you are professionally threatened when they're trying to do this power play, that you can, that they can push your buttons to the point to where they can get you to run out of the room or start crying or something like that. They know. In fact, they'll just pour it on them. They'll continually to, to continue to uh, defy you, and if they feel they can get away with it. If the revenge student, uh, seeking student, sees that you're hurt, the revenge and the the acts will continue to escalate, and it starts with little things. First, there's a pencil missing off of your desk. And then somebody scribbled on the grade book and you don't know who it is. Then things are missing from your desk or from your purse or from a drawer. Things like that start to happen. It's that escalating process of them getting revenge all the way up to the slashing tires in the parking lot and, and keying the cars, things like that. So those revenge-seeking students represent a more serious challenge to uh, the safety of other students as well as the, the uh, general well-running of the school in your classroom. Once again, if the failure avoiding student sees that you are unable to give them any help and that you're not trying to give them any help, they will go right on down the drain and continually uh, continue to just uh, try less and less because they know they don't care. They're just aching to get out of school where they can go home and sit or go someplace and do nothing or only what they want to do. Uh, so these are the four different ways that uh, uh, Dreikers and uh, Albert and these other researchers say that students misbehave for one of these four reasons. Now, when you're trying to select consequences for misbehavior, now we've had the prescribed ones that uh, Cantor had up on the wall, we've had the menu that Jones has, and now with this process here, uh, you have to watch where your consequence can create causing the resentment, the revenge, any of those kinds of things, that the consequences should promote social what this What does it mean to promote social order? That the consequences help to set things back right. That uh, everybody needs to understand there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. There's a good way to behave and a bad way to behave, and that's to go back into our social order. And here's the key part that makes Dreikers different to logically tie whatever the punishment is to the misbehavior. I'll give you an example. Class comes back from the lunchroom and uh, the lunch lady reports that table one's table was not cleaned, it was dirty. The consequence then would be to go back and clean table one and lose some of their free time in the time after uh, lunch, if you have something like that. Or they have to go back during everyone else's free time and clean the table in the day. Now, overdoing it, causing revenge, revenge would be saying, fine, if you're going to do that, the first time you've done this now, I'm going to make you go back and clean everybody's table after the entire lunch. You're going to miss out of everything today in the middle of the day. That would be pushing it too far. So you want to make sure that your consequence balances in terms of severity with the uh, misbehavior that you have. 
That's the clue. Trying to find something that matches up with the consequence is a key part of running this process. Uh, the consequence has to do with what are you going to do next? Very often, uh, I have to make a student admit what it is they did wrong. And this is a key thing. When you have a student that misbehaves and you want them to um, own up to it, I think it's important that you make them tell you physically, tell you with words, what they did wrong. And which rule, if you have a rule that they broke, uh, to tell you what, what rule that they broke. Doing that has such psychological significance to that child. If you can get them to do that, because usually when they do that, the tears will flow. But when they do that, also, it also sort of, it's a, a catharsis for them. It helps to relieve that pressure because they know they've done wrong. And whether they want to agree with it and have it pushed down or not, it allows them to take that weight off the shoulder. I've, I've admitted it. Then is when you as a teacher need to give them consequences with love. They need to understand, I love you. I do not love the way you behaved. And if you can say that and help the student understand that this is the wrong way to behave, and I know you can do the right way, then focus on, now the next time you get frustrated and your pencil breaks and you need another pencil, and you know Susie has an extra one, instead of just stealing it out of her purse or out of her desk, what should you do? And let them come up with the options in there so that we can talk about the next time this happens. That's the point about the consequences also. So it allows you to, to, uh, to be in control still in the classroom with this. Okay, two types of consequences, the natural and logical. And I'll go back between these two slides. The uh, natural consequences could be like when you reach up and touch a hot pan, the natural consequence is going to be that you burn your hand. Well, we can allow some natural consequences to serve as students, provided they're not going to be harmed. You don't want them physically or psychologically harmed. However, the more convenient one, or the one that you can then direct and determine and decide, says Dreikers, are logical consequences that you can arrange. Uh, you guys have a messy classroom. Uh, you left your room uh, in a mess and you've got paper all over the floor and crayon bits and crayon paper all over the floor, things like that. Fine. When everybody else goes out to the playground in our playground time this afternoon, we're going to clean our classroom. That's a logical consequence tied to the misbehavior. Do things like that, and that seems to submit itself a lot better in helping the students understand the result of their misbehavior, which was uh, making the room messy. So these ideas of having logical consequences turns it more from an external thing to an internal thing, where the students realize, oh, if I want to have some playground time, I'm going to have to make sure my area and any area that I see is cleaned up. And you can start beginning to spread out their, their responses to where they even pick up things that they didn't drop or mess up. That's the true growing uh, process when they go through that. We start in here, look at intrinsic motivation, self-control, and personal responsibility. Those three things certainly are not external. Uh, they're all internal uh, maturity, and it can start as early as kindergarten, probably pre-K, in terms of deciding to do things because it's the right thing to do. So how is it different? How are consequences different from punishments? Now, consequences, some people say it's the same, but consequences has to do with what happens in real life. When we speed, we get a speeding ticket. It's not when we speed, we don't get... Uh, a, a um, we don't lose our right to vote because that has no that's not even tied to the misbehavior. So in real life that happens. Uh, if we steal, we have to pay for it. If we break something, we have to pay for it. Things like that are logically tied to the misbehavior. So it's very much like that. And I like the point that it says right here at the bottom. It says uh, logical consequences involve no element of moral judgment. We're not trying to decide whether the child is a good child or a bad child. We're not trying to decide whether it's uh, legally right. We want them to understand that it's right for the means of our society, our classroom group, to be able to um, to be to be able to survive and cooperate and get along through the course of the day. But it's not saying you are a bad person. That is the kind of thing where uh, it's. A, a, a judgment based on the 
them as a, as a human. We want to try to avoid that at all costs if we can. Um, Tracker says that it should only be concerned with what should happen now. That uh, it's a it's sort of a you've done this now what's going to happen? It shouldn't be applied in a threatening way. You should just say okay here's the thing and here's what's going to happen. This is going to be your consequence. There when you have an opportunity you can provide choices. Fine you can either clean up the tables and miss your uh, playtime or because you left the lunchroom dirty uh, and you can miss your playtime and clean our classroom you got your choice uh, and you can do it that way that works better on an individual student than it does with a small group because then it, you get into a debate and you may not have time to put into that kind of thing uh, there's very often that uh, sometimes you hear teachers and you've heard parents to say this when a student is misbehaving they will ask the child are you making a good choice is that a good choice to do what you just did and to make them stop and think about their behavior and what they just did and very often they'll go back and fix it or they'll just flat tell you no I didn't make a good choice then you can give them the opportunity to go back and redo it or suffer a consequence okay five parts this all R's here it should be related to what you're doing it should be a reasonable consequence shouldn't be out of hand here and you can read these uh, parts in your PowerPoint uh, it should uh, be respectful of the student's self-esteem. We need, don't need to put the student down. It's the kind of thing that when you do create a consequence, it's something that you can reliably do. It's, it's, it is uh, it's something you can do every time because if you don't do it, then you don't have the consistency with it. So you need to be able to choose a consequence you can do every time that misbehavior occurs most of the time. Uh, this business about revealed in advance not in the sense of uh, Cantor's five rules, but you can also lay out the things such as if our classroom is messy, then somebody's going to lose some free time uh, cleaning up our classroom. If your paper is messy, you're going to lose some of your free time rewriting or redoing your paper. If you're if you didn't bring your books to school, you're going to lose some you know things like that where you let them know in advance as much as you can especially for breaking class rules and as you teach the class rules you can say what some of the consequences could be if they do break those class rules uh, and the whole all the way up to you don't get to go on the field trip in the spring or things like that but that's kind of a far away uh, example so when you have things that you can't predict then you have to have the logical consequences connected directly to the misbehavior so uh, here are the history of sort of a review of that evaluate the goal of the misbehavior Provide the interventions based on whatever the goal of the misbehavior was. If you see that they're attention seeking, that you need to have some interventions in that process. I had one student who raised his hand all the time and was doing the ooh, ooh, ooh business and wanted to yell out the answer before it was his turn, before I called on anyone, because he was so desperate for attention. I gave him five tokens and I said, These are your tickets to be able to, to give me an answer. In, or, when, in order to give me an answer, you have to pay me a ticket. And I would call that student. If they he did the ooh, ooh, I said, fine, but you have to give me a ticket. You can't say the answer. Or if they blurted it out, I would say, give me a ticket. But after you've used up your five tickets, you may not answer anymore. You may not raise your hand. You're done. The student understood that. Now, the next day, he used up all five tickets in the first probably hour. Within three or four weeks, he was down to saving three tickets to the end of the day where he could have three different things he wanted to answer. But the point was he began to realize and self-evaluate. Do I want to burn this token to be able to get attention right at this point or can I save it up and get attention later when I might need it? And eventually the tokens went away because uh, within a few weeks I lowered it to four tokens and then the three tokens and the student began to get the point. We talked about it uh, as we went through the whole process. That helped that child to self-regulate themselves. And it also helps to build that relationship to where the child begins to understand this teacher cares about me and is helping me to learn to be better. Speaking of that, learning, helping students connect. Uh, we have to make sure that um, we do not do anything ourselves as an example or as a modeling 
of anything but tolerance for diversity in our classrooms, for consideration of the different types and needs of uh, students that we have in our classroom, giving attention to students by listening and showing interest. This business here, this is where when a student comes up and wants to tell you something, usually this happens in the early part of the day. They come in, they want to tell you about something that happened last night. If you are still doing your work and you list, sort of glance over to them and, and go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then say, that's fine, honey, go back. They realize immediately that you did not give them your, your full attention. It's important that you put that pencil down and look at that child square in the eyes and listen to them and say, fine. Now, the downside of that is it can encourage students wanting to come up to tell you anything just to be able to get that one-on-one -on -one contact and one-on-one -on -one information. That's when you have to stop it and nip it in the bud on their way. And this is all part of your experience will help you build this up. You can stop them before they get up out of the seat. But there are those one or two students who want to tell you something important, and it's important that when you do talk with them, that you listen to them honestly, that you appreciate the things that they do. Uh, you spot a student picking up a piece of paper off the floor and say, in front of the class, thank you, Susan, for picking up that piece of paper. You made our classroom look a little bit better. I appreciate that. Letting them know that you appreciate the work they do in the classroom. Uh, dropping a note, having these, uh, there's examples of pre-written notes uh, everywhere, and I had a had a pad around here just a while ago of pre-written notes that say I can just where I can just literally tick 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 and and write a name and and say I am so proud of Susan, and you just take that and stick it in their book bag uh, when they get it, and when a parent gets that out, that's one of those things that goes on the refrigerator. It not only raises that child's self-esteem, it raises your status as a professional in the parent's eyes. If you get the opportunity to make the phone call, of course that helps, but. Uh, uh, when you have so, uh, a lot of students, especially those of you who may be teaching middle school, if you've got five classes with 22 or 23 or five in a class, you've got over 100 students to call. It's difficult to be able to call every time somebody does something good. But every now and then, it helps. Those of you who are teaching in regular classrooms with uh, 17 to 22 or three students in the K-5 realm, uh, I in my uh, uh, row book, I had a little place where I would put a check mark and make sure that I called home at least once on every one of those students with a good measure. Not anything more than to say, this is Mr. Gerald, I just wanted to call you and tell you that John is such a good student in my class and I wanted you to know I really appreciated it. I want to take the time and call you and say thanks for helping to grow this child into the fine young person that they are. That kind of thing, a little quick message, then it smooths the way for the next time you have to call them and say, we need to talk because John's misbehaving. Things are starting to disappear in the classroom, and I found them in John's book bag. That kind of process is the kind of thing that you need to do. Uh, spotting things, uh, the simple acts of kindness thing at the bottom of the slide here says, building affectionate relationships with simple acts of kindness. One skill on the desk of a student for no particular reason other than they're just doing their work quietly going about business. Well, let that student, they'll look up at you with a look that you can't buy with a thousand dollars. Well, maybe if you put a thousand dollars on their desk, but it's the kind of thing where they'll appreciate it because you're just recognizing and doing simple things. Or I had a student whose, uh, her hair barrette broke uh, at school. It was her favorite hair barrette. And uh, I happened to be in Walmart that night or Dollar Tree someplace like, and I saw a similar type one, a one with that, a, um, I can't think of the little girl on it, uh, on the on the barrette, and I bought it, and the next day when she came in, I said, I know you broke your barrette, uh, so I found another one uh, for you. I hope you like it. That little business just, I mean, it didn't cost me but a second to, to do that, but it certainly just lit her eyes up, and she, from that point on, I had one over that student in the classroom. Little simple acts of kindness will help. Okay, here's the upside and the downside. The good side of logical consequences is this whole business of learning how to, pre to promote the interaction between teacher and student and respect for one another and helping the student learn to take responsibility for their own actions. The downside of it is sometimes it's difficult to tell whether they're looking for attention or gaining power, you know, trying to determine what is the reason for their misbehavior and what's the motiva motivation behind it because you may assume it's one thing that, uh, but it's it's an entirely something entirely different. So it's a little difficult sometimes, especially when you don't have as much experience behind you to uh, be able to interpret many things like this. 
uh, don't always assume that their misbehavior is not the result of your poor planning. If they're misbehaving in the classroom, things are doing things like that, it may be of something that you did. And it's what I refer to as mirror work, uh, where very often I encourage teachers and student teachers to look at themselves first. What is it? Is there something I'm doing that's causing this problem? Am I moving the material too fast? Am I using words they don't understand? Am I not allowing them long enough time to work on their work? Am I take, uh, assuming too many things on their work before I go through it? Little things like that can start this misbehavior spiral going. So uh, once you do that, even if you do try to determine a logical consequence, because it's not a set response like uh, uh, Jones had or a set uh, list of them like uh, the uh, Cantor's list. So sometimes it's difficult to come up with a logical, connected, logically connected consequence, but they will come to you. They'll gather those ideas will be there uh, more and more as you gain more experience. Look at the chapter activities on page 94 and 95, and as they're reflecting on the theory questions. So it looks like uh, that pretty much wraps up chapter five with Rudy Dreikers. This myeducationlab.com has a is a website that's connected with the book, and there's a whole section at the very opening front of the textbook that you might want to look at. There's several examples in there where you can literally watch a video of students uh, how they behave and how the teacher reacts in the classroom uh, to help you see living examples of these types of misbehavior. So good luck, and we'll uh, see you next with Chapter 6. See you then. Bye.